I'm very excited to welcome you all to the webinar that we are hosting today for the Master of Engineering in Computer Engineering program at Dartmouth that we are hosting uh, in partnership with Coursera. A few logistics for today before we get started is that one, we will be recording this webinar and we'll send the link to the recording as well as to the slide deck out afterwards. And secondly, we will have a Q&A session at the end of this event, and we ask that you use the Q&A functionality to post your questions, and then we will collect them and respond to as many as we can live uh, at the end of the session. And for those that we don't get to, we will follow up via email. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Zofia Gatos at Dartmouth, who will uh, kick off this event and introduce our panelists for today. Hi, hello, and welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to, today we'll be going through some panelist introductions. We'll give you a little bit of an introduction to Dartmouth. We'll talk about our graduate engineering programs, and then we'll get into the specifics of the online Master of Engineering, and then talk about the student services and the application process. So here are the panelists that you'll be meeting today. I'm Zofia Gatos. I'm the Director of Online Education at Thayer. So I run this program and all of the other online um, ed education efforts at Thayer. You'll also hear from Gene Santos, who is our faculty director of the MNG program, and he'll be teaching one of the courses in the program as well. You'll hear from Ken Watson, who's the online education program manager at Thayer, and you'll also hear from Ryan West, who is one of the enrollment counselors from Coursera. A little background on Dartmouth, even though you'll be online, we really feel like it's important to have a sense of place and a sense of space. We want those of you who come to really feel like you are truly Dartmouth students and truly students at Dartmouth Engineering. So Hanover um, is this beautiful little New England town. Dartmouth was founded in 1769 and it's a member of the Ivy League and it consistently ranks among the world's top academic institutions. Hanover, New Hampshire itself is a small town New England setting that has easy access to the Northeastern metropolitan areas. We're about two-ish hours north of Boston, five hours or so from New York City. Uh, the region is a lively, inclusive community. It's home to a vibrant arts district and it's surrounded by majestic mountains, rivers, lakes, and scenic byways. Dartmouth is renowned for its deep commitment to outstanding undergraduate liberal arts and graduate education with distinguished research and scholarship in the arts and sciences and at its leading graduate schools. The Thayer School of Engineering, also known as Dartmouth Engineering, the Tuck School of Business, the Geisel School of Medicine, and the Gorini School of Graduate and Advanced Studies. Dartmouth's expansive network combines the intellectual reach and competitive strength of a leading research university with the accessibility and focus of a quintessential collegiate community, both in person and online. The Master of Engineering in Computer Engineering is Dartmouth's first fully online program, and it's offered through the Thayer School of Engineering at Dartmouth, one of the first professional schools of engineering in the country. At Thayer, we prepare the next generation of leaders to solve problems through engineering research and innovation with human-centered impact. Students enjoy direct access to faculty who are leading experts in their respective fields, and they learn in small, close-knit, collaborative teams. Some of the things that we're very proud of here at Dartmouth Engineering are that we were one of the first comprehensive research universities to reach gender parity in undergraduate engineering. In 2023, Dartmouth Engineering was just one of three schools nationwide to earn the highest distinction from the American Society for Engineering Education, the ASEE, for its significant progress in meeting diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. Dartmouth Engineering is also home to the nation's first doctoral level program in PhD innovation. Students in this highly selective fellowship program receive funding and support to launch their own startups and take their research discoveries to market. Dartmouth Engineering also leads the way for entrepreneurship and innovation. This is an image of our patent wall, which is actually in the building right outside my office. Um, and we have more than 50% of Dartmouth Engineering's core faculty have founded startups and more than two thirds hold patents that originate from research at Dartmouth. And as students, you'll gain unparalleled access to this renowned group of educators and expand both your network and your skill set. 
The online image in computer engineering is part of our portfolio of master's and doctoral degree programs that empower students to engage in pioneering work to advance critical knowledge and drive solutions to the world's most critical challenges. So we offer a PhD program. Um, we also offer different sorts of master's degrees. So there's a master of engineering, both now we have a, the online option and we also have in-person options. We offer a master of science and master of engineering management degree that has um, an influence from the Tuck School of Business as well. I'll now turn it over to Jean to tell you more about Dartmouth Engineering specifically and the MEng program specifically. Thank you, Zafia. So just to reiterate, I reintroduce myself a little bit. I'm Gene Santos. I'm the faculty director for the Master of Engineering program here. And as Zafia mentioned earlier, I'm also teaching one of the classes in this uh, computer engineering online series. So let me talk a little bit about Dartmouth. You know, Dartmouth is a pioneer in computing innovations. Some of you may have already heard that you know, Dartmouth first coined the term artificial intelligence in 1956. It was a conference of mathematicians that were working on the premise that both learning and intelligence can be, quote, so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it and, and see where we are now, right? So this meeting was the seminal event for artificial intelligence in the field. And it was organized by John McCarthy, some of you who may know, uh, is, a, is one of the fathers of AI. And at that time, he was a mathematics professor here at the college. Well, less than a decade after that, some of you may have heard of something called basic programming language. Dartmouth revolutionized computing with the introduction of basic. And so this is what actually made programming accessible worldwide at the time. Next slide, please. So, oops, hold on a second. <clears throat> So our online Master of Engineering Computer Engineering is designed to be a hands-on collab with collaborative projects rooted in active learning. The idea is that you'll, you'll not only master technical skills essential for virtual augmented reality, autonomous robots, self-driving cars, AI virtual assistants, wearable and planable devices, and a whole lot more. And, but the idea is that you also gain the power skills necessary for leadership and impact. Now, one of the things that we also try and uh, do is that, you know, the this nature of this program, so you can enjoy the convenience and flexibility designed around you. That is, you take the courses online on your own schedule, and you have the time to balance jobs, family, and other responsibilities with your schoolwork. So let me just go through the, the slide itself a little quickly. Our first cohort, as you may already know, will start in March 2024. Uh, I said the focus of this is why you heard all those kind of cool projects like virtual augmented reality and, and AI. Uh, we're focused on intelligent systems. And then the flexibility, which we'll show in the next slide. So let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Uh, we'll now look at says that, hey, you can take the courses on a part-time basis, which means like one or two courses. Uh, I mean, which usually means one course for uh, each term. And our terms is a quarter, 10 term week. And then we also have the full time, which is the two terms. So this slide gives you a snapshot of the nine courses uh, that are available and the potential time frame for you to take them to for you to take them. And uh, just a, a quick thing, I believe Sophia, right? We, we will be sending out, or Sarah, we'll be sending out the slide deck uh, for, to you folks also. Yes, yes, we'll be sharing the slides afterwards. And so next slide, please. Uh, just a quick faculty spotlight. There's me. I'm a faculty uh, in the engineering school here. I specialize in intelligent systems, <laughs> artificial intelligence. Uh, we also have Dr. Kofi Adame, uh, who specializes in electrical and computer engineering. And then we also have Dr. Peter Chin, who specializes in machine learning and game theory. So you know, these are three of the faculty members that you'll get to meet and teach in your classes in this program. So let me hand this off next to Ken. Thanks, Dr. Santos. Uh, hi, everyone. I, my name is Ken. I'm the online education program manager. Uh, and so in my role, I will be working with you to ensure you have the best possible uh, experience that you can enrolled in our Dartmouth program. Uh, and to that end, I'd like to spend the next couple of slides just talking to you about some of the student services and resources uh, that are going to be available to you as an enrolled student. The first of these is access to our financial aid office. Um, we want to point out that, that this degree program uh, is eligible for all of the standard uh, federal financial aid available to U.S. citizens and permanent residents 
uh, that you would find in many other degree programs across the nation. Um, we do encourage our students to, uh, in addition to those loan opportunities, to seek out external um, funding uh, through the form of scholarships and grants. And we will certainly work with you to help identify and support you as you, uh, as you apply for those, those funding opportunities. Uh, another key point that we'd like to make uh, for those of you who are employed is to um, speak with your employer about the possibility for tuition reimbursement or tuition assistance programs. In many cases, if this degree is gonna help you with your uh, current role, uh, then employers are certainly open to, to sharing uh, the cost or, or helping you with the cost of this degree as they're going to see uh, just as much of a benefit from it as, as you will. So we certainly encourage you to speak with your employer about the possibility for that. Um, our partners at Coursera have a, uh, a number of resources available uh, on their website that can help you identify um, grants and scholarship opportunities, particularly given the fact that this is a STEM-based degree, they're out there. Uh, and so we can work with you to identify those, those, um, those funding opportunities. Um, as Dr. Santos mentioned, part-time enrollment in this program is one course per term. Uh, and so uh, in most cases, for most forms of financial aid, you need to be enrolled in at least one, one course, uh, you need to be enrolled part-time. So, so just one course a term is all it takes uh, for most forms of financial aid. And um, so, so transitioning from that, financial aid is just one, one piece of the, uh, the student services pie that we would like to present to you. Um, we are, are hopeful that one of the biggest takeaways from this presentation today, there, there's a lot of information that's being shared with you, but one of the one of the key elements here is that we really want you to understand that that um, it, students enrolled in this program are, are just as much uh, a member of the Dartmouth community as students who are in Hanover, New Hampshire every day sitting in our brick and mortar classes. Um, your your enrollment in this degree program makes you a Dartmouth student. And uh, so to that end, uh, there are a number of services and resources available to you including uh, our computing and library services who offer um, both asynchronous support in the form of email and text conversations, uh, as well as uh, virtual appointments in which they can, they can have one-on-one -on -one discussions with you. We work closely with an organization called You Will that is a telehealth company uh, focused on um, uh, student wellness and um, mindfulness. And so as a, as a remote student, you'd have access to, uh, to the, the benefits offered through you will. You can even have a Dartmouth student ID card. Uh, if you're interested, we're going to share uh, information on uploading a picture and ordering a card. And if you are, are not local, uh, then we'll work with you on, on retrieving that card for you and getting it, it sent out to you wherever you may happen to be in the world. Um, there are lots of benefits to a graduate education, um, primarily the, the skill sets that you're going to learn within the courses. Um, but we can't also understate the the um, networking opportunities and the fact that you're going to be part of a larger uh, population of, of Dartmouth alumni who've gone on to do really great things and are interested in helping out um, uh, fellow alumni. So I have more detail in, a, in another slide here, but uh, the networking opportunities are certainly a, a, a wonderful benefit to this degree program. And I know that it seems like it's really far away at this point. We're just talking about applications, but I want to today invite you uh, to attend our investiture and commencement ceremonies. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is this is a, a Dartmouth education is no small feat, and uh, we invite you when you have completed your degree program to come to campus, put on a cap and gown, and walk with your fellow students to celebrate your accomplishments. Uh, so start start planning for that trip now if you're able to make it. So uh, I mentioned the, the Dartmouth Alumni Association, and, and I just want to focus a little bit more on some of the benefits that they offer because, uh, you know, as, as I said, the, the, um, the network that you become a part of as a, as a Dartmouth graduate is, is one of the really, um, you know, foundational benefits to this degree program. So um, the Alumni Association is really involved in all levels of um, the student body giving students an opportunity and, and, and graduates an opportunity to engage, connect, learn, and serve. Uh, and so to that end, um, they plan many of the same types of events that you would encounter from other alumni associations. Perhaps uh, you've seen them in your undergraduate or, or, or uh, other, other graduate programs you've been a part of. 
Um, but they, they do some pretty unique things as well that we'd like to call attention to, including the Dartmouth on Location series. Uh, so this is uh, events that are planned around the world in which members of the Dartmouth community uh, go to where you may be and, or somewhere close and, and let you know about things that are going on on the Dartmouth campus. And this could be research or what's going on in their labs or some of the new innovations that they're, uh, that they're investigating. And um, it gives you the opportunity to be connected to the campus uh, to connect with other alumni that are in your area um, and, and stay up to date with what's going on uh, here in, in New Hampshire. They do a series as a kind of a subset of this called Dartmouth on Location for Kids uh, that also offers um, family-friendly programming. Um, so it's, it's a, a great way to stay involved and connected to the Dartmouth community. Um, in addition to the Dartmouth on Location series, there are also continuing education opportunities uh, through Dartmouth X, um, which does virtual and online training sessions and workshops. Um, so your Dartmouth education doesn't end uh, in the classroom. You'll have the opportunity to continue that, uh, again, wherever you may be in the world. Um, another really fantastic aspect of, uh, of Thayer and Dartmouth and, and this degree program is your ability to interact closely with our really outstanding staff in the Career Services Office. Uh, we have the, the word dedicated is italicized there for a reason. They are very dedicated individuals uh, whose sole purpose is to work with you, whether you are looking for your first job or you're already in the field and looking to advance or maybe looking to change careers. Uh, our Career Services Office can offer a suite of, of different services uh, and advice that will help you achieve whatever your goal may be. Um, much of this is done virtually, including things like career fairs and recruiting sessions, um, but they also do things like resume review and interview um, practice. Uh, so um, the Career Services Office uh, is another a really, really important piece of the, of the Dartmouth experience. Uh, and we encourage you to reach out to them uh, it's never too early. You, you can do it on your first day and they'll, they'll be involved in the onboarding process. Uh, so get to know them, let them know what your goals and, and aspirations are, and they'll, they'll do their best to work with you to, to achieve that. Uh, and, and some of the logos that you see at the bottom of this slide uh, are kind of an indication of some of the, the really outstanding places that many of our, um, our graduates have, have ended up working. Um, and so I think to kind of wrap up these last few slides that I've been talking about here, um, we want to reiterate the fact that there is a there is a team of people, myself included, uh, many of whom are on this slide and some who are, who are on this presentation and some who are not, um, that are, are here and dedicated to making sure that this experience for you is as meaningful and as valuable uh, as as you can make it. Um, we are here to, to support you. You're gonna come away with an outstanding education and, and, and an outstanding uh, set of skills that will set you apart um, from others in the field. Um, but there are, is much more to the graduate experience than, than what you're gonna see in the, in the classroom. Uh, and so there's a team of people here to help you really maximize uh, this time that's gonna go really quickly, even if you're doing part-time, it'll fly by. Uh, and so um, take advantage of that, reach out to us, look for those opportunities. Uh, and we feel that that our um, our track record is as evidenced by by some of the places and positions that our graduates have ended up uh, really speaks for itself. So we thank you for being here. We thank you for considering the, the Dartmouth um, Master of Engineering and Computer Engineering program. We hope to have the opportunity to, to review your application soon. Uh, and with that in mind, I'm going to hand it over to Ryan, our enrollment counselor, who's going to give you a little bit more detail about the application process. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'll be supporting and, and providing support through the admission process, through an exploratory phase, if you're just starting to look into the program. So um, I will be here to help uh, along the way. As far as the applications coming up, the great news is um, applications are now open for the spring 2024 cohort. Uh, so as you can see on the screen there, as far as timelines, you're looking at a January 15th priority application deadline there. Um, with that, you can have the $50 application fee waived if you do get your application in by the priority deadline. Um, the following month, you'll have the regular deadline for all remaining applications in February on the 15th. 
And then classes will begin on the 25th. Um, as far as reviewing applications for the upcoming spring term, the review will begin in January, and then the admission decisions will be provided um, within a short time frame afterwards. So um, in the applications itself, I love to stress um, Dartmouth is fantastic at reviewing applications holistically. You have a very unique opportunity in your written statements and the other application materials to um, represent yourself, what you plan to bring to the program, and um, they will look at all aspects of the application. Um, so uh, as you're working through that, if you do have questions, um, we'll be here to help through that. Um, I'm glad to go through any questions along the way if you do start an application. Um, coming up for the fall cohort, the second cohort in 2024, um, you actually are able to apply early. So uh, looking at the general time frames, June 15th, that'll be the priority deadline. Again, the application fee of $50 can be waived if you do have it in by that time frame. One month later, July 15th, will be the remaining applications and the deadline for that. And then the second cohort will be starting in September on the 16th with classes beginning. Um, the regular review for applications will begin in June. So um, starting after that initial deadline there, um, you do have the opportunity if you'd like to find out details sooner on admission. Um, if you do submit your application for the fall in the January, February timeframe, if it's submitted by then, um, they are able to start looking at um, decisions for that time frame early for fall. But um, as I said earlier, uh, we're here to help. I'll be glad to go through questions, anything that's important for you in the process, and certainly provide support. Um, look forward to hearing from you. Excellent. Thank you all very much uh, for this great session today. Again, apologies for the any technical difficulties, um, but thank you to those who have been posting questions in the Q&A along the way. I'm going to start reading some of those now. We'll use this opportunity to start addressing those questions. If we don't get to everything today, we will certainly follow up via email. And again, just wanted to reiterate that we are recording this session um, and we will be sending out the recording as well as the slide deck that we covered here today. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start coming through some of the questions that we received. Um, and so for the first question is thinking about the prerequisites for this program and maybe something that this is either I will direct to either uh, Ken, um, Jean or Sophia. Um, if you could talk a little bit about what skills or foundational knowledge would we recommend or uh, to have as a prerequisite um, knowledge for this program. Yeah, so I can address that. So we typically recommend that people have a bachelor's degree in engineering uh, because a lot of the uh, classes have that background, which is the engineering courses, the engineering mathematics and engineering science behind it. However, for people with degrees, you know, non-engineering, uh, those, for example, have degrees in the sciences such as mathematics, physics, uh, uh, more closely related ones we'll also consider. Uh, and then on a case-by-case -case basis, we will review your application to see for example, if you have a degree outside uh, the, the STEM area, uh, we can take a look at that. Great. Thank you, Eugene. Um, another question that we received, uh, what is the size or number of students um, to be expected for the first cohort of the program? And Sophia, would you like to address that one? Sure. You know, we're we're going to be balancing um, size of the cohort with uh, the number of qualified applicants. We're hoping for a small-ish cohort where in the first year, we're gonna welcome about 55 students total. That's open to flex a little bit, um, depending on the number of qualified applicants that we get. And then the program will go over time and we're hoping for around 200 students per year coming in um, at our steady state as we grow. We wanna make sure we, Take students who are qualified, and but not so many that it's more than we can provide a good student experience for, because that's what's really important to us is really making sure that all of you who come feel like you are really our students here at Dartmouth Engineering and have a good student experience. Great. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, this question I'll direct to Ken to have him address. Um, this person is wondering when we when they finish the program, 
um, will it be a master of computer engineering degree that will be on their resume? Can you talk about how just the MEng degree is awarded from Thayer and from Dartmouth and how that would appear um, on their diploma? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so yes. Um, and this is this, I think, uh, in some ways ties back to what I was talking about before with, um, you know, the, the fact that students completing this degree program and, and, and working through this, this journey in the online space are just as much uh, a student as anybody who is on campus. So uh, to answer the question, yes, it is a master of engineering. Um, there's no that is awarded through uh, the Thayer School of Engineering at Dartmouth. So uh, there's no indication on the um, on your on your actual diploma on the piece of paper that differentiates online versus uh, residential. Uh, it's the it's the same degree that um, that's awarded that our, our residential students earn as a, a master of engineering. Great, thanks, Ken. Another question that we received, and Jean, I'm going to direct this one to you, is about the curriculum. Uh, and this person is was reviewing the courses of, for the online Amend program, and and noticed that they are a little bit different from those from the on-campus courses. Can you talk a little bit about how the courses for this online program uh, were designed or redesigned uh, specifically for the online sure. program? You know, our, our online program was designed for all the classes to fit together. You know, if you've noticed all the way to the end, we also have a capstone. We're trying to make sure we have a theme. So the, the, the courses that are described for the online uh, are basically variations of the courses that we're already offering. And in some cases, you're getting uh, new courses that have not been offered in the engineering school. As I said, it, it, everything ties together and up to the capstone. And when you define the projects, that's how each of the pieces fit together. Great, thank you, Jean. Um, this question I'm gonna to direct toward to Zofia. This is about the timeline to completion. Uh, so this question is, is it mandatory to complete all of the courses within 27 months. This person is interested in enrolling in maybe uh, a couple of courses per year, and one is not sure if that is an option. Um, and then in that case, it would take four to five years to complete. Could you talk a little bit about someone who wants to take more of that part-time route? Uh, yeah, what that looks absolutely. Like? You do not have to complete straight through in 27 months. We'll give you six years to complete the degree from the time you start your first course. So you will be able to take quarters off during that time. Um, right now, we're planning on allowing you to take two consecutive quarters off without going through any kind of leave process. Because of the way the course schedules are offered, and this is something we'll be working with you to make sure that you know how to plan your schedule appropriately, but you'll need to make sure that you're planning for which terms you want to take off so that you can take all your nine courses. But yeah, we really want to support all of you have that flexibility to complete the degree on a schedule that works for you. Great, thank you, Sophia. Um, let's see, another question. Uh, Ken, I'll direct this to you. You've touched upon this already, um, but this person is wondering, are there any other um, in-person or residential activities um, at any time during the program besides um, commencement and investiture? And then maybe you could talk a little bit about how students would be welcome to come to campus if they were in the area or what that might look like. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so this is um, this is this is definitely something that we want to encourage. You know, I think it's important that we communicate um, the the efforts that we are putting in now uh, to ensuring that students who are studying remotely have access to as many resources and, and services as possible. Um, but for those of you who are in in the Northeast or happen to be traveling through uh, and would like to come, then uh, you are absolutely um, encouraged to and, and welcome uh, to come to campus. There are a number of events um, that will be communicated to you through uh, the graduate um, uh, email lists. You'll, you'll be added to, to many of the same communication channels that our residential students are, are added to. And so um, there are a number of events that, that go on on campus on a daily basis um, that you would be invited to. Um, if you are going to be in the area, we would encourage you to reach out and let us know and, and uh, um, myself or, or another member of our team uh, would be happy to, to meet with you and, and show you around a little bit and uh, introduce you to, to faculty and the folks who are, who are going to be on campus that day. Um, but but um, in addition to, to some of those things that I mentioned, um, there are athletic events that, that you'd be welcome to attend. 
Um, there are, uh, uh, you know, back to back to school weekends and, and reunion weekends and things like that, that offer a number of opportunities to connect with fellow students. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, presentations and, and discussions and workshops, um, all of which you would be eligible to participate in. So, um, yes, certainly if you're, if you're in the area or if you will be traveling through the area, we would, we would welcome you to campus. Um, please stop by and, and say hello, and we'll, we'll be sure to welcome you. Excellent. Thanks, Ken. Um, we're getting some more uh, course-specific questions that I will direct uh, to Jean. One of them, and this is maybe getting up in the weeds, um, is it necessary to have formally studied digital circuit design as a prereq for the FPGA course? I would say yes, uh, although one of the things that uh, I'll also bring up is that when we ask for your applications, one of the things that we also have you list down is that maybe you already have some real world experience. And part of that, you know, discuss your experiences, discuss what you've worked on that can help, you know, also better figure out, you know, do you have it F the background? Great. Thank you, Jean. Um, let's see. Someone was asking a question about the capstone project. If it does get patented, Will it be a property of Dartmouth? I don't want to misanswer that. You know, uh, it, it'd be best if we also uh, talk to somebody who's dealing directly with the Dartmouth Patenting Office. But it typically, uh, the patent would be basic code by both the student and Dartmouth itself. And there's things that are worked out in the contract between that. Great. Thanks, Jean. Um, so going back to some of the um, the, the prereq um, knowledge that we've been talking about. Um, so we've been suggesting, you know, some Coursera programming courses to help students kind of brush up their skills. Um, are there any more Coursera courses or, or topics to think about to audit or take that could help um, others with getting a good foundation for the degree? And maybe, um, Sophia, this could be an opportunity to talk about some of um, Dartmouth's courses on Coursera and other things to be thinking about. Yeah, so, so one thing resource I'll point you to is we offer a C programming with Linux specialization on Coursera. So that's a, an existing Dartmouth online, um, offering to help you be prepared with C programming skills that will be useful, particularly in the embedded systems course. They will also likely come back up when you take the FPGA course. So that's one possible offering. Then I also just encourage you to look for courses that, give you at least a basic understanding of machine learning, maybe brush up on your Python coding skills, um, touch up on some MATLAB. There, there are a lot of good resources out there that you can use to prepare yourself or refresh any skills that might have gotten a little bit rusty um, in the time when you last studied them. I don't know if anyone else has anything they'd like to add to that. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to another question, I'll direct this um, to, uh, to to Ken and Orion. Um, just thinking, this question is about the GPA, and in the past, um, you know, the three point three three um, has been, you know, historically sort of what students entering the Master of Engineering program have had. And so this person is wondering, um, is that a hard and fast rule? And I'm wondering if um, either of you could just speak to how we look at applications holistically. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and Ryan, feel free to, to jump in here. I'll, I'll, I'll kick us off, though. Um, so um, I think that it was it was a, a short bullet point on one of the slides that Ryan was talking about. But I do want to emphasize the fact that um, that the applications here are um, are reviewed as a whole. And so, um, you know, while we do, it is it is it is a you know, Dartmouth education and we, we are selective about students that are admitted. Um, we do look at all aspects of your preparation and qualification for this, this program. And so um, if students have a GPA that is around a 3.3, but maybe not quite right at that threshold, um, that is where, you know, Dr. Santos mentioned um, some of the additional um, um, practical experience that you have may help uh, come in and, and bolster that. Um, there are opportunities for providing writing samples also, that um, will give you the chance to um, give us a little bit more context and a little bit more background 
on your experiences and, and what got you to the point that you're at. And, and, you know, we understand that not everybody was a, a outstanding student as an undergraduate perhaps, um, but has, has, you know, done the work to, to um, bolster their, their knowledge and their skill sets. Um, and so you will certainly have the opportunity to share that information with us and we encourage you to do so. Um, so, so to answer your question, the GPA is an important aspect um, and it is certainly something that we look at, um, but I, I don't know that I would necessarily call it a make or break uh, kind of threshold. I think if you have other um, pieces to the, to the, the puzzle that, that makes up you um, that can help uh, kind of inform that and, and, and explain it, then, then that's certainly something we would consider. Did I hit all, hit all the points there, Ryan, do you think? Yeah, I think you made a great point, Ken. Um, right in a program like this, which is exciting, you have such a dynamic group of um, backgrounds, age ranges, work experiences, um, education, formally, right, and informally. Um, just from discussions I've had, um, many people have had, you know, their own self-study or taking additional programs or certifications or things beyond their undergraduate or if they already have a graduate degree. So. Um, that holistic approach absolutely allows you, um, and that's why there's some written parts of the application that allow you to elaborate on those things, the experiences you've had, um, and uh, really present a good case for yourself. So if, if there's one area you feel is maybe a little weaker, um, you can certainly accentuate the other things that um, you know really show your readiness for a program like this. And... Um, you know, the application even allows you to show your excitement and understanding of what the degree will allow you to do in your career. Um, understanding a degree and the fit that it makes for you um, is an important thing as a student or a potential student, right? You want to make sure you're getting into a program that's going to support you with your career goals. Um, and so you have in the opportunity uh, with the application to demonstrate your understanding of what this degree prepares you for and um, how that lines up with what you want to do long term as well. So, um, yeah, the holistic um, application approach is very important to understand. Um, it is not a um, approach where there is a hyper focus on one particular area only. Great. Thank you both, Ryan and Ken. Um, another question we received, and I'm going to direct this to Jean. These, we've had a couple of people that have been interested in the PhD program, um, and this learner in particular is interested in to knowing how can the MEng program help prepare someone for the PhD um, and potentially the PhD in innovation program. Can you talk sure. a little bit about that pathway? Yeah, sure. So one of the important things about the MEng program is that you are taking advanced engineering classes. So you're being, a, 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 you know, if, you're being, what is it, exposed to state-of-the-art engineering questions, engineering problems, and, and the background. And what that does is that it gives you a leg up uh, in going into the PhD, because the whole point of the PhD program is really what new research contributions, what new problems can you identify and solve? So that's how, how, that's how that leads into that. And also helps lead into, into the innovation program, too, in that you know, you're, again, doing innovative problem solving. Great. Thank you, Jean. Let's see. Um, you know, we've covered a lot of questions so far, so I'm trying to make sure that um, we haven't missed uh, different topics that would be helpful to cover. Um, one of the questions is, uh, does Dartmouth uh, partner or, uh, or co-partner with any AI industries and or leader companies? I don't know if that's anything that, that we, we could speak to or just or anything in there with the AI connection, whether industries or not that we might be able to speak to? Uh, I'll say it this way. I mean, we have a lot of partnerships between uh, professors and various, uh, you know, industries outside. Um, we also have a number of alumni who are directly involved in the AI industry. So some of you may have heard, you know, we one of our alumni is uh, currently the, uh, Mira Marathi is currently the CTO of OpenAI. So there's a lot of different connections that are going on out there. Uh, it's, it's, it just depends on what you're focused on and to be able to answer more specifically beyond that. Thank you. Um, let's see. 
Um, going through, uh, so the, one question we received is somebody um, who's interested in, in, in cybersecurity and is just wondering, um, can this program um, help support someone's future or career path in, in cybersecurity? Let me just take a quick shot at that. So uh, this program is, of course, focused on intelligence systems, computer engineering. And at the same time, that is a big component of cybersecurity nowadays, of what we look at. So a lot of the materials that you learn will have relationships to cybersecurity. Uh, we don't explicitly ask that question, you know, like, you know, you know, what what would happen, for example, you know, you're looking at uh, cybersecurity of intelligence systems, you know, how how vulnerable are they? What are the risks? We don't go into that, but that gives you foundations in the cybersecurity. Great, thank you. Let's see. Um, I want to be mindful of the time. I realize we're approaching time uh, in a few minutes. Ken or Zofia, um, based off the questions that we've been covering so far, and or Ryan too, is there anything else that you think would be helpful to address at this point? Um, in, the, in this group that we haven't yet addressed. And again, we can we'll follow up with more information via email, but I wanted to just see if any of the panelists have anything else. I'm seeing a lot of questions from international students wondering if they are welcome to apply. Yes, absolutely, you are welcome to apply. Uh, because the program is online, you won't need a visa to come. So you can take the program from most places in the world. I'm sure there are some restrictions based on country thing, um, you know, various governmental restrictions, but basically, yes, international students are more than welcome. If under certain circumstances, you will be required to submit a proof of English proficiency. Um, and maybe Ken, do you want to talk more about that? Sure. So there are, uh, a number of uh, schools and we have links to, to the, the detailed list. I think there are about a dozen or so, um, countries, where uh, if you have um, if you, you have citizenship or you were you were uh, uh, achieved your your uh, some education in those places where English is a primary language, um, then the uh, the the proficiency requirement is waived. Um, uh, or if you are from a country that's not on that list, but you earned um, an undergraduate or another graduate degree uh, in the United States. Um, then, then the proficiency uh, uh, requirement is waived. We do accept uh, proficiency scores from a number of organizations, including um, Duolingo, um, which oftentimes presents um, a more economic and easily accessible um, English proficiency exam. Um, so uh, there are ways to 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 achieve the 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 to get access to the the proficiency requirements. If you have questions uh, about that and whether your particular situation requires one, uh, I would encourage you to send us an email. You can email online.engineering at Dartmouth, uh, and we'll make sure that we get back to you and, and, and take a look at your particular situation um, and, and background, and, and we can identify whether that, that uh, proficiency exam is going to be a requirement or not. Um, but just to, just to echo Sophia's sentiment, uh, Yes, we we encourage and welcome international students in this program. Great, thank you, Kenan. Oh, yes, go ahead, Brian. Uh, sorry, but no. I would just add, um, especially with the um, spring cohort coming up, uh, I've been in enrollment for a very long time. This time of year speeds up quickly. So obviously, we're almost done with October. November and December are coming quickly. A lot of times with work and other year-end responsibilities, things stack up, holidays and other things as well. Just make it a busy time of year. So I would encourage you, if you feel the program's a good fit and you're excited, um, certainly get an application underway. As I've mentioned, um, I'll be here along with others to support you in that process. Um, when you apply, I would recommend as one of your earlier steps also, um, reaching out to your recommenders and formally requesting the recommendations. Uh, the other steps are really on your own time frame. The one thing that's typically out of someone's control is the recommendations. You're relying on others. So if you uh, make that as one of your earlier steps, that'll be helpful. So that'll be in place while you're working on the other steps and getting your application wrapped up. Um, also, I would encourage, um, we talked about the holistic review process, recommendations, can be very helpful. 
So um, in that, be thoughtful when you're asking somebody for recommendation. I would encourage um, talk with them and see if they're able to be intentional and provide a well thought out recommendation. Specifics are always encouraged. Um, sometimes job recommendations tend to be generic. So um, be selective in who you ask to help out where they can speak to your work, your background, your characteristics, things that will stand out in the recommendations. Um, so it's not just a generic recommendation. But um, yeah, I will be here to help, as I mentioned, along the way. And excited to uh, to help many of you through. Great, thank you all. There, there are a couple more questions I thought that might be helpful to address right before we wrap up. Uh, one of them I'll direct um, to Candace Potter on our team um, who works closely with our admissions and financial aid process. Um, and Candy, Ken covered this earlier about financial aid, but I know we're getting some questions um, uh, just about financial aid and, and, and loans and what that looks like. And if you could just briefly just touch upon that again, I think that would be helpful. Absolutely happy to. Um, yes, as Ken said, you'll work very closely with our Dartmouth Financial Aid Office to process any possible loans to cover the cost of this program. Um, that's uh, how this uh, aid would work for this program is through loans at this point. Um, the other thing I did want to touch upon, if it's okay, Sarah, if I add this to my sure. my response, um, I've I've seen a couple questions about um, is this for um, high school students or or who this uh, program is meant for? It's definitely a graduate degree, so we would expect that people in this program would have come from um, an undergraduate background um, before stepping into this program. Thank you, Candy. Um, let's see. Um, and and lastly, um, I think we've um, been addressing this too, but um, do we want to just touch upon briefly just about um, the group work in the program? This question has come up just wanting to understand um, about group projects uh, throughout the program and sort of like how the program is designed around group work. I can take this one. Um, Many of the courses, not all necessarily, will have group projects. This kind of simulates what you'll be doing in the working world, where you will be working in teams, working with other people, maybe other people who are distributed around the world. So we want to give you that experience in the graduate program as well. And there will also be other projects in the course. We really want to keep that hands-on Dartmouth engineering feel where you're working on projects that actually have real-world applications rather than just some like abstract coursework type thing. So we're really trying to tie tie the course content to things that you'll be doing once you actually leave school. Great, thank you, Sophia. Um, and so on that note, unless any of the panelists um, want to add any additional insights, I think we are at time uh, for this webinar. We appreciate all of the uh, questions and the dialogue that we've had today. We will certainly send the recording and the slides for any questions that we did get to cover in detail. We can follow up via email. Please feel free to reach out to our admissions team to, and, to, and to Ryan. Uh, we are happy to help answer your questions and we appreciate your interest. So thank you everyone and to our panelists uh, for joining today. Uh, we really appreciate the conversation that we had. <laughs>